explain um, the fundamental principles of induction heating, uh, in particular, of course, the rule of the electromagnetic penetration depth, the material properties. And I will also tell something about the, the power balances and the very important efficiency of the process itself. Um, in the last third of my presentation, I will show some uh, applications and uh, some new developments. And uh, finally, I would like to conclude um, my talk. When we are uh, speaking about uh, induction heating, uh, we can say that uh, today we have uh, many multifunctional applications we can find uh, in the industry of induction heating. This could be uh, induction heat treatment, like we can see in the upper left corner for, for induction hardening, the uh, induction through heating, for example, on the um, left-hand side for induction forging or slab heating, or even uh, induction heating for, for strip heating. And um, mainly, we can find these uh, applications in uh, metallurgical industry, but also we can find it in uh, semiconductor industry, like uh, the silicon crystal growing we can see in the upper right corner. But not only for, for heating and for heat treatment or induction applications are used, but also for joining, like uh, induction welding, for example, induction tube welding, or in combination together with, with laser applications. When we are not speaking about heating, we can uh, open the field to melting of materials, melting of conventional materials, but also melting of very special materials like uh, titanium alloys, for example, in the cold crucible. But uh, today I want to concentrate my webinar on induction heating. And uh, first, uh, we can ask ourselves why induction technologies for heat processing solutions are used so frequently in industry. And I have tried to uh, write down some typical features and advantages of induction heating technologies. And you can see even one slide is not enough. So we can have, of course, very high temperatures if required. So we are, in principle, not limited, like, for example, with a gas flame uh, in temperature. And the main advantage is that the heat can be generated within the material. This means we have a very fast heating. We can have an exact temperature distribution in the material. We can induction technology is very good integrate into production lines with high reliability, and we have a comparable high efficiency. The processes are normally very reproducible. This is very important for heat treatment, for example. And the high energy density leads, of course, to a fast processing if required. Um, electrodynamic forces, I will also explain later, are important mainly for induction melting. But uh, for old technologies, it's, of course, important that we have a less environmental impact and a low specific energy consumption. Also, the atmosphere can be uh, variable. We can heat even in under gas atmosphere, special atmosphere, and we have a high level of automation. And why uh, we have this uh, typical features, I will try to, to start from the, from the basics and to explain where they are coming um, from. And the basics, of course, of uh, induction heating is the electrical principle of the induction effect itself. It's uh, well known also from, from the electrical transformer or from electrical engine or uh, electrical generator. And uh, in principle, it is based on, on two laws, uh, the so-called uh, Maxwell equations. Um, the first is um, the physical principle that uh, all uh, that uh, an electric current always generates an um, electromagnetic field, as we can see on the uh, left-hand side of the slide. This is the so-called Ampere's law. And uh, the electromagnetic field can be, of course, created by a DC current, but also by AC current. In this case, we have an oscillating magnetic field. And if this magnetic field uh, penetrates a, a coil as, uh, or better, let me say, an open winding, um, of a wire, then we can come to the second important equation. This is the Faraday's law, that at the open winding, we can measure a voltage which is induced there. And uh, this induced uh, voltage, of course, depends on the strength of the magnetic field, but in particular on the, on the frequency. That means on the oscillating 
uh, of the magnetic field. And uh, if the frequency is higher, then the induced voltage even is also higher. And uh, when we close um, this uh, open winding, um, and we are coming to the right-hand side of the slide, then we will have a short, a high shortcut current uh, in the secondary coil. And uh, the shortcut current uh, also creates, of course, to the Ampere's law, due to the Ampere's law, an electromagnetic field. And this brings us to the next important uh, principle. This is the Lenz law, that the direction of the secondary current is in this way that the magnetic field is in opposite side than the primary magnetic field. And this effect leads uh, to a damping effect inside of the shortcut coil. This is a very important phenomenon which we have to take into account when we are speaking about induction. But we don't want to speak about only this transformer effect that means the energy transfer between the primary coil and the secondary coil. When we are speaking of induction heating, the secondary coil normally uh, consists of a conducting body. This could be, like you see in this slide, a cylindrical body, for example, a workpiece which has to be heated. And uh, in this case, we also, of course, due to the conduct electrical conductivity of this workpiece, we also induce electric current. And uh, these currents are running in recirculating loops, and therefore they are called eddy currents. And of course, all of these eddy currents create a magnetic field, which leads to the damping effect. I will come more in detail later. And uh, a very nice example to my mind, you can see on the right-hand side of this slide, this is the induction heating of a tube. And from this picture, we can see already a lot of advantages of induction heating. We can see that the heat is generated inside the material, inside the body, that means, in this case, inside this tube due to the eddy currents. And uh, we can also see that we don't need a contact between a primary coil and the uh, workpiece to be heated because the energy is transferred by the electromagnetic field. And this allows us, of course, also to have a relative movement between the workpiece, for example, and the coil. We can also see that the heat mainly is generated there where we have concentrated the electromagnetic fields. It means inside this coil, as you can see here. So we have a local heating effect that not the whole tube is heated, but only there where we uh, penetrate the electromagnetic field and where we generate the eddy currents. If we look to the mathematical equations, which I don't want to explain in detail during this webinar, which should be more application-oriented. But we can say that all these physical principles I have explained can be described very precisely by mathematical equations, by the Ampere's law, by the Faraday's law, and uh, of course also by the Ohm's law. And uh, all these mathematical equations uh, can be solved today mainly using, of course, numerical finite element methods, for example, but they can solve also for simple configuration by analytical solutions. And the basic equation which has to be solved is the electromagnetic field equation, which is coming uh, from the two Maxwell equations. But this can be done today very precisely using finite element codes, for example. When we Speaking about induction heating, of course, we have to take into account the temperature field, which is generated due to the Joule effect, to the, to, due to the current inside the workpiece. And the temperature field can be uh, precisely uh, calculated using the, uh, the, using the Fourier heat conduction equation, which you can see on this slide. And as you can see, that the joule heat, is, which is coming from the uh, electromagnetic uh, solution, is the coupling between the electromagnetic field. So 
solution and the Fourier heat conduction equation. And this is the input for calculating the temperature field distribution inside the workpiece. But we can also see that the material properties of the workpiece to be heated play a very important role because this material properties has to be taken into account. This is the heat conductivity, this is the density, this is the heat capacity, the electrical conductivity, and uh, for many materials they are known, but in particular for new innovative materials in many cases they are not known and uh, they are very important for precise calculation of uh, the temperature field inside uh, the body or inside the workpiece. And um, most of these material properties which play an important role are depending of course on temperature itself or like permeability also on the magnetic field strength. And then very simple example where we know the material properties is a, special, is a steel C45 for example where the electrical and thermal properties are known and you can see here that they strongly depend depend on the temperature and this has to be also taken into account when we are speaking for example of numerical simulation of induction heating uh, problems then we have to know also these material properties which is sometimes very difficult. As I mentioned already that uh, the secondary current uh, generates also an electromagnetic field, also a magnetic field, which leads to a damping effect inside the workpiece. And uh, this physical principle leads to the skin effect, which is very important for the induction heating. Because due to the skin effect, the current density inside the workpiece is not homogeneously distributed, but it is distributed like you can see in this sketch in this way that we have the maximum of the current density always at the surface of the cylindrical workpiece in this case and it is strongly decreasing from the distance of the, the surface. And this uh, distribution of the current density depends on the material properties like the resistivity but also on the permeability of the workpiece. But uh, very important is the influence of the frequency. And um, the quantitative uh, value of this uh, current density distribution is the electromagnetic penetration depth, which formula you can see on this slide. And this is uh, the key factor for designing of induction heating applications. And you can see that the electromagnetic penetration depth we can find where the current density has dropped down to 37% of the maximum current density at the surface. This uh, is coming from the analytical uh, solution of the Maxwell equations um, then where we can find this, this value. And you can see also that with the frequency of the current in the primary coil, we have an influence on the electromagnetic penetration depth in this way that for higher frequen frequencies we can get a smaller penetration depth and for lower frequency we have a higher penetration depth. And uh, of course if the electric current density is distributed in this way like you can see it on the, this slide um, in the cylindrical workpiece also, the joule heat, which is generated by the electrical current, has a strongly dependence um, um, inside the workpiece. So in this way, that the maximum joule heat is generated mainly in the surface area of the workpiece. This uh, can be described um, by the power density, which is induced in the workpiece, by the formula you can see here. And um, of course, we, are the, we have the power density, also the, the heat density is generated. And this has, of course, a strongly influence also on the temperature distribution in the, uh, in the workpiece, like you can see. And uh, 
this slide number 12 shows again the influence and the dependence between the current density and the power density inside the body to be heated. This is the exact solution for an infinite conductive half space, but we can use it as an approximation also for a cylindrical body. And you can see that due to the fact that the power density depends on the square of the current density, we can see that about 86% of the induced power inside uh, is, is induced inside the penetration depth. And this, of course, can be influenced by the frequency. So if we need a heating of more of the surface of the workpiece, we can use a higher frequency, for example, for induction surface hardening. If we want to have a through heating of the complete body, we can use a lower frequency. Uh, another very important effect when we are speaking about induction heating is the so-called proximity effect. Because the proximity effect plays an important role, uh, for example, between two conductors, like you can see in the sketch, but also between uh, the induction coil and the workpiece. Uh, and the, work piece. the uh, proximity effect shows that the electrical current in the two conductors are concentrated at the inner opposite side, opposite side of the inductors, like it is shown here in the sketch. So we have a concentration of the current at the inner side um, between the induction coil and the workpiece. And this is a very important, for example, for designing of the coil so that the wall thickness of the copper tube has to be designed in this way, depending on frequency, um, taking into account the penetration depth where the current density has a the highest values. Another important effect when we are speaking about induction heating is uh, electromagnetic field guiding elements, which can be used, um, like it is shown in the sketch on the right-hand side, electromagnetic field guiding syst uh, systems, which can be designed in the surround the copper coil, uh, for example, uh, from laminates, from ferrites, but also, of course, from magnetic flux concentrators. And uh, these field guiding elements are concentrating uh, the magnetic field, for example, for defined heating of the workpiece, the field guiding systems, um, but, but they also guide the field in the proximity of the inductor, and they can use also for reduction of magnetic stray fields and for the improvement of the total efficiency. Here you can see an example on the right-hand side where a field guiding system of laminates is used in order to concentrate the generated heat uh, below this inductor and below this field guiding system. And uh, a very nice example for this you can see on this slide on the right-hand side where uh, magnetic flux concentrators are used. And we can see the situation without magnetic flux concentrators at the upper part of the picture, where you can see that the magnetic field is uh, penetrating the surrounding of the induction coil. And when we use a magnetic flux concentrator, we can concentrate the magnetic field uh, near the inductor coil itself, and we and can increase the power density, which is induced in the workpiece under the inductor. So this is a very important design element in order to design the induction heating uh, system. A very, another important point are electromagnetic forces. Um, we have to um, consider two different kinds of electromagnetic forces which can appear in induction system, heating system. This can be first magnetic forces due to the magnetic properties, the permeability of the body, which are exposed to the magnetic field of the current in the inductor. In this case, the workpiece will be pulled into the magnetic field of the induction coil. But when we are speaking about magnetic forces due to the current in the inductor exposed to magnetic fields, the so-called Lorentz forces, in this case, the workpiece can be pushed out of the magnetic field in the induction. And this 
has to be taken into account when we design an induction heating installation, for example, for hardening, where we can have a high magnetic fields due to high currents and a small distance between workpiece and uh, induction coil that we have to fix it mechanically so in this way that the workpiece will be not pushed by the electromagnetic forces or the inductor will not push away by the electromagnetic forces. And a very simple example I have uh, put on the, down on, in the slide where as you can see the very uh, simple estimation about the electromagnetic forces in case of currents in straight line conductors. And you can see here that in this case if we have an opposite direction of the current we have forces which try to push away the in conductors from each other and it can be calculated very simple depending on the current and the inductors of course on, and on the distance uh, between the conductors. As I mentioned already the penetration depth depends on the frequency very strongly and uh, this is illustrated in this uh, picture where you can see the penetration depth depending on the frequency and I have marked uh, some lines you can see here for example copper material where we have at line frequency of 50 hertz uh, the penetration depth of 10 millimeters for example. If we go to higher frequencies and we can see that then the penetration depth decrease and this is important for the design of the induction coil but also for the design of the heating process um, I want to realize. And the change of the material properties uh, in case of steel which is marked in the blue color at different temperatures, we can see here that when we heat up a steel workpiece, for example, from 20 degrees at a frequency of 1 kilohertz, we have a penetration depth of below 1 millimeter, 0.8 millimeters. When we heat up this steel bar or the steel workpiece to 400 degrees, uh, we get already more than one, the two millimeters, but when we are leaving uh, the magnetic uh, properties that means we are higher than Curie temperature at 1000 degrees the penetration depth uh, increases to uh, near to 20 millimeters. So we have a, a strong influence due to this material properties on the penetration depth and uh, sometimes we have also to take into account this uh, strong influence when we have to design an installation. As I mentioned already that the frequency is a very important factor for the design of induction heating technologies and therefore for different processes we have different kinds of frequencies. Here are some examples, for example for through heating, for deforming, that means forging, pressing, rolling, we, need a, we use normally lower frequencies in the range of line frequencies up to some kilohertz. For heat treatment, this could be hardening or kneeling. We have some hundred hertz up to megahertz, but also for cutting and welding, normally we use higher frequencies. So we use a wide range of frequencies depending on the technology we want to realize. Another very important point is the electrical efficiency. Um, because we want to heat it with a very high efficiency and this can be analytical estimated by the formula you see on the left hand side of the slide. The efficiency of course is always the ratio between the induced power and the total power that means induced power plus the losses in the inductor. And you can see here that the efficiency depends of course from geometry but also from the ratio between the electrical resistivity of the copper coil and the electrical resistivity of the material to be heated. That means if the resistivity of the material to be heated is high, the electrical efficiency is higher. Also an important factor is the ratio between the workpiece diameter and the penetration depth. You can see on the right hand side and maybe more illustrative is this fact on slide number 20 where you can see the electrical efficiency depending on the workpiece diameter over the penetration depth. So we need a certain penetration depth in order to get a high efficiency. This should be the ratio D to delta should be as you can see here normally higher than 4, 5 or 6. But you can see also that the efficiency strongly depends 
on the material itself. So in principle, for heating of steel, we have a higher efficiency than for heating of copper, for example, because the resistivity of steel is higher. And for through heating applications, normally we need a high average power density, and there we have to find a compromise between high, <coughs> um, between a big volume we want to be heat, to heat, and high to use high frequency to have a low uh, penetration depth and to get a high efficiency. And this compromise leads to this curve where we can find a maximum of the average power density in the range of 3.5, and this is a very important guideline when we are designing through heating installations. And this experiment shows, to my mind, very nice what happens if we put in one coil as an experiment billets with different diameters. And you can see that the smaller diameter is, will be not heated because we are more in the left side of the curve, in D to delta, maybe in the ratio between one and two. If we have a bigger diameter, it, it is too big, we are on the right-hand side, so you can find an optimal diameter with an optimal ratio D to delta, where we have the optimal power volume and therefore a very fast heating. Um, this slide, number 23, should illustrate the so-called through heating time, which is also important for the designing of heating of billets. And you can see also here the influence of the frequency on the through heating time. In this case, the frequency of 1 kilohertz and 10 kilohertz is compared between, um, and um, you can see the different temperature curves from starting to 10 minutes of heating time, and we can, see, we can clearly see the influence of the frequency to have a homogeneous temperature distribution. For in this case, 1 kilohertz, of course, is more preferable than uh, 10 kilohertz. Here, as an example, you can see a typical heating installation for through heating, uh, what I have explained just now. Normally, they are arranged that the heater itself is put on the converter, on this yellow converter, and so the billets can be fed through the induction coil, and on the left-hand side, you can see how the billets are coming out. This is a typical curve from an induction heating installation with a one coil induction heating system. You can see that due to the effect of the penetration depth, of course, we have the surface temperature higher at the beginning than the core temperature. The core temperature has to follow by heat conduction. And finally, the, we should have a homogeneous temperature distribution inside the billet like it is shown here in this slide. If we have uh, longer installations with several induction heating coils, then today sometimes a flexible zone heating arrangement with several power supplies are used. This means that each coil, as you can see here in this picture, is connected to one converter. And so we have the possibility to adapt the power and to adapt the frequency to the situation inside the coil when the material is heat it up, and this will be maybe more clear when we look to this slide. So we have different zones, in this case four zones, and we can, power, and we can control the power for each zone depending on the situation of the heated billet. For example, at the beginning, we can use a lower frequency with high power, then we can, in the second zone, we can change the frequency so that we have always optimal ratio between the diameter and the penetration depth of the billet to be heated and finally to get a homogeneous temperature um, with, a high, with a high efficient working heater. The induction heating for forging, of course, is a typical example for induction heating applications. Traditional, it is running um, with a temperature in the range of 1,200 50 degrees centigrade, uh, but uh, due to the increasing requirements of the forging industry, that means reduced specific heat energy demand, that means less scaling, reduced surface decarburization, higher product quality. Sometimes it is, uh, uh, gives advantages if we use this warm forging process, where we heat only up to 900 degrees. But in this case, sometimes we need an induction reheating process because we cannot the part in one step, and this 
is a possible process chain where we have an initial heating at the left hand side, we have a rolling procedure uh, process, and in the third step we need the intermediate heating, and this means we have to heat up a billet which is not completely cylindrical, but which has to already been rolled and which has an inhomogeneous temperature distribution as you can see on the right hand side and this has to be heated up then again to 900 degrees centigrade. But this could save energy and could save, um, um, uh, it could lead to less scaling of the surface. This means uh, to more precise forging operations. Another um, widespread in application of induction heating is induction surface hardening, heat treatment. This is also well established because it has a lot of advantages. We have high power densities as I mentioned already, so we can heat up the surface very fast. But uh, today we need have more complicated parts to be heated like uh, crankshafts, etc. And so we are using numerical tools for designing this kind of uh, induction heaters. And here you can see also very clear the influence of the frequency for an induction hardening process for different frequencies. It is shown as an example of a shift color. And you can see if the frequency is 20 kilohertz, for example, in the center of the, this slide, we have a hot spot in the root of the tooth. If the frequency is too high, we can heat or the, the hot spot is at the tip of the tooth. So it's necessary to find an optimal uh, frequency to have a homogeneous, uh, to have a well-defined temperature distribution and finally hardening distribution of the workplace. And sometimes it makes sense also to use two frequencies at the same time, the so-called simultaneous frequency. In the last years, uh, the wind energy plants came up more and more and therefore a lot of uh, new applications for induction hardening of wind energy turbine, as you can see in this example, and sometimes there has to be heated very large diameter of bearing rings or with a diameter of several meters um, has to be heated and there are different concepts used. As you can see here, for example, the gear wheel hardening, this could be tooth by tooth hardening, this could be gap by gap hardening or spin hardening. So there are different approaches to heat these big bearings, these really large uh, gear wheels. Um, of wind energy turbines as a typical, let me say, recent uh, application for induction heating. And as you have seen, that there, it is necessary to have a well design of the induction coil for different applications and therefore a lot of different designs could be of the induction coil as you can see here at this uh, slide. There are some examples how the induction coil could look like depending on the heating application. When we are speaking about heating of flat material like strips and sheets uh, in industry, there are two different approaches in general. We have a so-called longitudinal flux induction heating on the left hand side. This is a conventional heating where this induction coil is surrounding the strip. And due to the slides I have shown you, due to the necessary uh, ratio between the diameter or the thickness of the strip and the electromagnetic penetration of delta, which should be in the range of three and five, we need higher frequencies when we want to heat up very thin strips. But then we have also no possibility for a variable distribution. On the right hand side, you can see another approach. This is the so called transit flux heating. We have two pairs of coils, for example, one is in the upper part and the lower part of the strip. And the magnetic flux in this case is normal to the strip surface. And in this case, we can use lower frequency because we are operating in the ratio D over delta lower than one. And this maybe it becomes more clear as in this example where we are speaking about strip heating with a strip thickness about 2.5 millimeters. And this leads uh, to a penetration depth which is necessary of 0.6 millimeters. And when we look to the curve which frequency we can use for heating of steel, we can find that for steel of 400 degrees, the blue uh, line, we need a frequency of 10 kilohertz. But when we heat up the steel sheet above 1000 degrees over Curie temperature, 
we have already to use a frequency of 800 kilohertz. And this means for very thin, not um, for very thin scripts and sheets, the transfer flux heating concept, where we can low, use lower frequencies, has sometimes um, big advantages. Here you can see a typical example of such a longitudinal field heating of thin slabs, only to give you an impression how it can look like. Another field of many applications for induction heating is the production of tubes. This could be the welding of the tubes, the tube welding, but this could also be the seam annealing of the tubes or the cutting or the complete tube annealing. So there are also a lot of applications for induction heating. And here you can see as an example how it looks like an industrial installation for seam annealing where these are big machines where the tubes are running through and where the seam, which, has, which was welded, has to be annealed locally. That means not to heat up the complete tube again, but only this zone where the, where the welding uh, has been done. I said already that um, a combination with, of, of induction technologies with other technologies sometimes is uh, uh, preferable, for example, the induction technology with laser welding processes. Laser welding is a very modern and uh, process, gives a lot of advantages because we have a very concentrated energy, we have a high speed welding, but sometimes the high energy density is uh, too much, so we have some, um, some effects that we have some changing in material properties which uh, lead to undesirable effects. And therefore, sometimes it is very useful to combine the laser technology with the induction technology to uh, increase the welding speed, for example, or to improve or adapt the final um, material properties. Um, there are also for, for, for welding of very thick materials could be helpful to use first the induction coil for heating up the material and then to use the laser for the final welding. Let's finally speak about the principal arrangement of the induction heating installation. Up to now, I have concentrated my talk mainly on the inductor and workpiece itself. Of course, um, we need a converter in order to, to deliver the power supply. This converter consists normally of a rectifier, an intermediate circuit in the in inverter, and uh, is connected to the grid. And the uh, load itself normally consists of an oscillating circuit, which is uh, built from the uh, capacitor and the induction workpiece arrangement. And of course, we need also a cooling system for cooling converter, but also for cooling in particular the induction coil, where we have high currents and we have to, to cool the coil itself. And of course, um, when we are looking to this arrangement, we have also to look to the energy balance of a total induction heating equipment. Um, this is an example that shows the energy balance for a forging um, installation. For example, um, on the right hand side, we see that we need a, an energy of around 240 kilowatt hours per ton to heat up this steel, for example, on 1250 degrees centigrade for forging, but due to different efficiencies, the thermal efficiency influenced by the radiation of the, of the heat from the workpiece, the, the inductor itself, this is the electrical efficiency, as I showed, um, the, the bus bars have an efficiency, that means they have losses, uh, the converter itself has uh, losses, and of course also transformer to the grid connection has losses. So if we see the whole energy balance, we come totally to efficiency of 0.56% means we need in total around 45 kilowatt hours per ton. But you can clearly see that the biggest losses came or are coming from the inductor itself, from the electrical efficiency of the inductor. Finally, let's have a short look to a comparison between the induction technology or electrothermal technology, let me say, with other technologies. And this you can see here on this slide where the final energy demand of the installation itself, the primary energy demand, and the CO2 emission of the total process is uh, compared. And uh, we can see that, of course, the direct heating, the so-called ohmic heater, where we have a conductive direct heating, 
it has, is the best solution, but this is sometimes not flexible enough, has some technological disadvantages. And for induction heating, we have normally a lower scale formation, and uh, we have, can also realize a continuous process with high throughput with induction heating. And the total CO2 emission today is in the same order like if we use a gas-fired furnace, but due to the increasing uh, power supply by renewable energies from wind turbines, from photovoltaic, we expect that the CO2 emission and the primary energy um, demand will decrease in future. So that gives us also a big advantage for induction heating uh, technologies. Yeah, let's resume finally uh, the main features I have tried to explain during my talk. We have seen that we have a contactless heating and we have a direct heating inside the workpiece. I think this is the main advantages of induction heating. And we can have a local and time dependent heating, high power density, high process temperatures, a very high heating up speeds and high thermal efficiencies. Therefore, and the power can be controlled very carefully by the converter and we are flexible in operation and have applications in different atmosphere and even in vacuum. So this was my webinar. I thank you all for your kind attention, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much.